Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here with us today. I'm going to read Romans 8.15. Romans 8.15 to start us off today. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 15. It says this, <clears throat> For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Yesterday, my wife and I and our family were out and uh, spending some time together, just getting out of the house. My wife doesn't go crazy. And uh, we were enjoying ourselves. And on our way home, we turned on uh, one of our uh, favorite Christian uh, radio stations, uh, Haven Radio. It's an internet uh, uh, Christian radio program. Uh, and uh, we were listening to that, and it, we turned it on. It was preaching going on. It was very, uh, very much needed, a great blessing. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and <coughs> the preacher was preaching on this verse about the spirit <coughs> of adoption. And <coughs> he was getting some, giving some points about the spirit of adoption and what that should look like and what it should look like in the home. And uh, the spirit of adoption uh, should have love in it. And uh, so the spirit of adoption uh, should have love in your homes. The spirit of uh, adoption should have security in it that uh, you feel safe, that uh, <clears throat> you feel like everything's going to be okay. And um, the preacher gave this example uh, of a young boy. He was about six years old. And uh, he, was at, he was going to school at that point, and he came home, and he was very sad, and his dad noticed that something was off about his son, and so he asked his son, what's going on, son? What's going on with you? And he said, oh, nothing. He said, no, you need to talk to me. Something's off. What's going on? Share with me what's on your heart. And so the little boy said, well, I just came home from school, and four of my friends, their parents are getting a divorce. Their dads are leaving. And <clears throat> the little boy asked his dad, he said, are you getting ready to leave us too? And what that little boy needed was security, to know that dad was going to be there. And so that father <clears throat> sat down, looked at his son, looked him in the eyes. They said, I want you to understand something. I want you to look at me, and I want you to believe what I'm telling you. I love your mom, and there is absolutely nothing that's going to take me away from your mom. I love her. And I love you, and I'm committed to her, and there's nothing that could ever force me to leave your mom. And that gave that little boy hope and security, a spirit of adoption. That, And that's what we get with our Savior, too. That's what we get with God. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's always going to be there. He's always going to listen to us. And my wife made a comment to me uh, that was just simply this, you know, uh, and again, None of our parents are perfect, but can I just say this? That would have been something wonderful, she said, that would have been something wonderful for me to hear from my dad growing up. And all that really was is just simply this. It was just restating the vows that were taken at the altar in an understandable way for a six-year-old to understand. So this, uh, the spirit of adoption, the... Uh, uh, the spirit of love, the spirit of security, and the spirit of acceptance. And uh, my wife and I listened to that message, and we're uh, listening to that point about acceptance. And uh, this preacher said this, you know, it doesn't matter how much truth is in a church. If there's not the spirit of acceptance for those who are at that church, they will leave to go find acceptance. And that really just touched my heart, it touched her heart. Just the truth that in this spirit of adoption that we receive from God, it's something that we're supposed to also express to others. And I just uh, was meditating upon that thought and those few thoughts that we got the opportunity to hear. And I pray that we would be a church that would exhibit a spirit of adoption, that no matter who walked through these doors, no matter what their past was, no matter what they had done, no matter what, they would have and find here what they would find in the Lord, acceptance and love and security. That we'd find that in our homes, that we would find it in our church, because that's what we find with our Father. And can I say this to you here this morning? I know I don't say it enough, and uh, perhaps I need to say it more, but uh, God loves you, and I love you. I want you to know that. I'm appreciative of our teenagers. I love you, teenagers. I know I don't say that enough. 
I love you parents. I don't say that enough. You college students, I'm working on you. No. I appreciate you. And I hope that even though I may not say it the way I need to say it a lot of the times, perhaps, I hope that you would understand that spirit of adoption in this place from me as your pastor. Spirit of love, spirit of acceptance, and a spirit of security. Would you please pray with me today? Father, we come before you, and I thank you for how you continuously work in our lives. I pray, dear Father, that you'd be with us today as we recognize the spirit of adoption that you have towards us in love and security and <clears throat> acceptance, dear Father, that you'd help us to find joy in that today, to find the peace and fulfillment that you desire for that to bring in our lives, and that as we experience that hope and joy and blessing and happiness that comes as a result of that, may we lift up our voices now in praise and adoration for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Very excited to see you all here. Glad you could make it out. We're going to get started with our first hymn. If you're at home, it's going to be 350 here. It's all, Are You Washed in the Blood? Let's all stand as we sing. If you have your paper there, Are You Washed in the Blood? I pray that you are this morning as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? So be ready for the mansions bright, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean who will be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Hymn number 514, as we continue our song service, <clears throat> excuse me, 514, He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. No, that's true. I pray you do as well as we sing on the first. I was lost in sin, but Jesus rescued me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was bound by fear, but Jesus set me free. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. 
I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a friend so true, so patient and so kind. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Everything I need, in Him I always find. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Dearer grows the love of Jesus day by day. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Sweeter is His grace while pressing on my way. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you for that, Mrs. Campbell. That was In Christ Alone. Beautiful song. If you don't know it, you should look up those words. Beautiful song. We're going to get started, or not get started. We already are started. We're going to go to our next song, our next hymn. It's Standing on the Promises. You can't sing this song sitting down. So we're going to do something different. We're going to stand and sing 445, Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. On the first. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. 
sing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. And open your Bibles to Exodus chapter number 4. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 4. I'm a privilege to be here with you today. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 4. And uh, <clears throat> since we did something different this morning, Brother Ross throwing me all off. No, <laughs> it was good that we st stood for that song. I, I appreciated that difference. I, I think it's good to throw a hiccup in there every once in a while just to keep us all on our toes. And so Exodus chapter 4, we'll read verses 1 through 9. You, you may remain seated as we read this morning uh, just to throw another hiccup at you. And uh, so, Exodus 4, verses 1 through 9, would you please follow along as I read aloud. The Bible says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? He said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. He put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said further, More unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Would you please pray with me this morning? Father, we come before you again today. And Lord, you know uh, the burden on my heart. Lord, you know how I desire to be used as a tool in your hand to be a blessing to these thy people. And I pray, dear Father, that you would meet with us today, that your presence would be known. I pray to God that you would do the work that only you can do. Help us, dear Father, to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would place your loving hedge of thorns of protection about us, that you would bind any evil 
spirits or evil thoughts and distractions from entering into our minds or bringing things up to us that we would uh, be deterred from the message today. We pray for those who may be viewing live or in the days and weeks to come. We pray to God that you would uh, uh, be with them and help them to not have any technical difficulties, but that they would be able to go all the way through the message with us today. May you be, again, gathered all the honor and glory unto yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. This past Friday was a pretty tough day for me. If I'm honest, uh, my heart was broken through some uh, things that came up in that day, which we won't get into, uh, just was broken and uh, spent some time praying and doing business with the Lord and began to weep in the middle of the classroom downstairs with our Christian school students. And it was a hard day. If I could say it like this, it was a hard day because of the burden and the passion that the Lord has put in my heart for people. I think all of us who have been Christians and all of us especially who have uh, served in a ministry capacity, those who are parents, those who have invested in others, it's hard when you see that your investment doesn't have return of value. Does that make sense? And I wasn't trying to have a poor, pitiful me party. I wasn't trying to do that, but my heart was broken. To think of the numbers of people who have come into this place and left this place. And the statistics show... There has, at, at this point, the statistics show there's not been a return of investment. Almost as if <clears throat> everything that was invested in was despised. And while you talk to people face to face, they say one thing, but their life demonstrates another. Does that make sense to you this morning? It was a hard day. I talked to my wife about it when she came over for lunch with our boys and just expressed my sorrow. And I didn't want to be a distraction to the school students any further than I had been already. So I went home with our children and my wife finished the rest of the school day for me. Appreciate that very much. But I have a burning desire in my heart for other people, really in two main categories. The first would be this, is that people would come to know the love of God and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. The second would be that Christians would live a victorious, fulfilled, Christ-centered life because they love God. And that if and that, that they would find the joy that I found. Does that make sense to you today? That they'd find the meaning for their life that God has shown me for my life. And I'm not saying that your meaning would be my meaning, but that you would find that purpose, and that Christians would find that purpose. I don't do what I do because of others, but I do what I do because God has told me to invest in others. And I don't know the eternal weight of, of reward that will be in their life. And that's my desire. As I sat there and I just wept at my desk Friday, as I thought of the people of our church, and I thought of uh, our teenagers, the college and career, those that are faithful and those that are on the fringes. I, I just simply said to the Lord, God, I wish I could see their future as you see it, and I wish I could just see that they're going to be okay. I wish I could see that they would make the right choice, even though they may not be in the right place right now. I wish I could see them delivered 
and know it's going to be okay. But I can't. I've come to realize that as much as I want to pour my heart into others and that they'd be as passionate and zealous and victorious and joyful and peaceful and blessed. Yeah, pastor, it sounds like you really were. Hey, listen, all of us have bad days. And as I was just sitting there, I came to realize I can't do it for them. But God can use me to impact them and help them make the right decision. In order for God to use me to make an impact in these areas, several things need to take place. The first is this. I need to directly and outright share the gospel. In order for people to get saved, they need to hear the truth of the gospel. Plainly, clearly. In order for Christians to live the victorious and purpose-filled life that God would have them to live is they need to hear the truth outright and directly. But sometimes they won't believe what you say. Moses said here in our text, they won't believe me. And so I started thinking, Lord, what are some other ways? Because certainly they don't accept all the time. So some other things need to be true and some other things need to take place in our lives in order for people to, be imp to have that impact that we desire to have on them. Is the first, besides the, the other one that we just gave, is I need to let God make use of my possessions for His name in a miraculous way. The, second, the, the third, really, but I need to also make my life available for God to use in a miraculous way for His name. My life. And then our last thought that we'll cover this morning through the message is, you know, sometimes I just need to realize I might need to change my approach periodically. I mean, I may need to change my mind or renew my mind from God's Word about a certain issue or a certain topic because I might be approaching it wrong. I may need to make sure my love for people is evident and clear as God's love is evident and clear. I may need to change my approach in communication, and we can go through all of these things. And I believe that through our text today, we're going to see these truths in the life of Moses. Now, again... I believe Moses ultimately said this, but they won't believe me because he's trying to excuse himself from God's call in his life. It'd be something like this. God, I know what you've said, but they're not going to believe me, so let's just call it a day and move on. Trying to excuse himself from the call of God in his life. He'd been called of God, we saw it in chapter 3. He's been called of God to go to Egypt, to be God's man, to deliver Israel from bondage in Egypt. He tells him in verse 10 of chapter 3, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I think that's pretty clear, wouldn't you say? It's very direct, very clear. You are the man. I am choosing to do this work. We know Moses responds with verse 11, Who am I to be involved with such a great work? We've covered already, but Moses' failure has humbled him, and he realizes he can't do this work. Beyond this Moses does not believe he can be used, and he doesn't want to be used. Verse 12, God answers his excuse and says, I'll be with you. In verse 12, in verse 13, Moses asks, who am I going to tell him sent me? And God says in verse 14, tell him that I am hath sent you. He tells him to go in his name, and they will believe. If you'd look with me, just very quickly, in verse number 16 of, of Exodus 3, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me. I have surely visited you and seen, the, uh, seen that which is done unto, you, done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And look at verse 18, look at the promise, the certainty, the surety there. And they what? Shall hearken to thy voice. They shall hearken 
to thy voice. Tell them, Moses, what I've told you. I've seen. I've heard. I'm a witness. And I have a plan. Go tell them outright, I have sent you. And there was that promise that they shall hearken to his voice. That means that the people were going to listen. Doesn't that what, isn't that what that means? And they shall hearken to thy voice. Isn't that a promise? It is a promise. He had to simply just go and tell them directly. God has sent me. I, he has appeared unto me. This is what he said, and this is what he told me to tell you. It's time to go. But Moses says in verse chapter 4, verse 1, they won't believe me. They won't believe my message that I have met with God, and that God has given me his message. He, nobody's going to believe that God has appeared to a murdering fugitive out in the backside of the desert with a burning bush that didn't actually get burnt. <laughs> that you've talked with me. They're going to think I was dehydrated and hallucinating. They're not going to believe me. Why would they believe me? I think that it would be important for us to ask this question. What, what would have happened, and we can only surmise, but I believe this would be true. What would have happened if Moses had just said at this point, all right, God, and got up and went, and he told them directly, this is what God said. What, what, what would have happened if they had said, is there any proof that you can provide that this really happened and that you're not just some crazy goat herder from Midian? God, what proof... Or what proof can you provide, Moses? And I, th I believe if Moses had just gone and done what God had told him to do, first there would have been a great group that would have believed. There would have been some skeptics. And in that moment, for those skeptics, God would have directly and immediately instructed him as to how to proceed. Does that make sense to you this morning? I hope I'm communicating this clearly. What would have happened if he didn't say verse 1 of chapter 4? They won't believe me. If he didn't say that and he just went and there were skeptics, what would have happened? God already had a plan. God, what should I do? They don't believe me. I'm here. Some believe and some don't. God, what should I do? Throw your rod on the ground. Imagine how surprised Moses would have been with everybody else if he had done that for the first time in front of everybody. We saw that he picked up and ran. He was down on his face, remember, he was on his knees on his face before God in this burning bush that was, that was there, and he throws his rod on the ground, it becomes a serpent, he runs from it. Can you imagine an 80-year-old man jumping up off of his knees to run from a snake? Because that's what just happened here. He's up and gone. God tells him, God would have told him to do the same thing with the rod. He would have told him to do the same thing with the hand, and it would have become leprous. Put it back in, it'll be as the other flesh. What would have happened if he had just gone? God, would have already, God had already provided a path out. God had already provided a way for them to believe. This morning, our, our, our main thought is this, is taken from our text here as we read chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, as we get here in verse number 5, this is our text, or excuse me, our title for our text today in our message, that they may believe. That they may believe. This morning, you and I are alive today to serve God so that others may believe. That others may believe the way to salvation and forgiveness and heaven, the way that, that we are here today to serve God and to witness to others that they may believe. But we're also here, listen, we're here for our future generations. Secondly, for this, that they may believe that Christ is the only fulfilling life to live. And the only way they're going to know that is to first tell them that directly. The lost need to hear the message directly. You are a sinner, and God loves you, and He provided His Son for you so that you can be saved, so that He could forgive you, so that Christ could pay you the, the, the penalty for your sin and not you. 
Our young people need to hear directly and listen. We need to share our testimonies with them. We need to share how God has brought us up out of sin and the misery that we were in sin. And we need to do the same thing that God commanded the children of Israel to do. Brother Ross is going to get into it here tonight a little bit with his message and wisdom. But we need to do the same thing that God told the children of Israel to do. Our gener the future generations, the ones coming up behind us, they haven't seen all the victories God's brought in your life. They haven't seen the misery that sin has brought into your life. All they can see is the supposed victory you're having in Christ right now. And they need to know, they need to be told directly, if you go down this path, they need to be told it by their moms and their dads. They need to be told it by their brothers and sisters in Christ. They need to be told by their Sunday school teachers. If you go down this path, it's not worth living it. They need to be told that directly. God told Moses to tell them directly what he had said. Can I just tell you this here this morning? There's no greater witness of the truth than the Word of God. There's no greater witness than this truth. Titus 1.9, it says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Acts 18.28, for, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. All these verses that we covered so far is just simply this, emphasizing this, the Word of God is key. The Word of God, listen, if an individual is going to come to recognize that their attitude is wrong, that the way that they treat their spouse is wrong, that rebellion as a teenager is wrong, that alcohol is wrong, if they're going to come to know the truth, there's no greater witness of the truth than the Word of God. If a person is going to get saved, there's no greater truth, testimony or witness of the truth than the Word of God. We all are familiar with Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. It's not a parable. It's a reality. It was a real account. I didn't change the batteries, apparently. But as we would consider Luke 16, it's a real account. And Jesus gives that account of a man in hell that lifted up his voice to Father Abraham. And he says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus back to speak to my five brethren so they don't come to this place. And Abraham told that rich man these words. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. The rich man said, Nay, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The Word of God is the most powerful witness that God has and that you can use to convince somebody that they are lost, and need of a Savior, and that their life, if they continue, if they're saved and they're living in sin, will be destroyed. It's the greatest tool you have. God's Word must do the work of convincing people of their need of a Savior, and God's Word must do the work of convincing Christians that Christ is the fulfilled life. God's Word must penetrate the heart to renew the mind of a need of change. 
When a Christian is having trouble in their life, they must, if we can use this term, they must come to faith about that issue from the Word of God. They must see that what God says is true about that issue and where they have believed a lie, they are now living out a lie. John 17, 17, Jesus said this, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Romans 12, 1 and 2, we're all very familiar with these verses. I beseech thee therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renew your mind. If somebody's, if a Christian is in sin, what is going to change their mind? The judgment of the Word of God. The truth of the Word of God. The application of revealing light in darkness. Taking the lie and confronting it with the truth directly. Well, nobody loves me. Is that true? Or is that an exaggeration? I feel like I don't have any friends. I don't have anybody to talk to. Is that true? Or are you just purposefully ignoring and running away from those that are there to help you? There's nothing good. Is that true? We need to, you understand, we need to combat it with the truth. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Christian, if you're struggling today, you know what needs to happen. You need to be confronted with the word of God. If you're struggling today, can I tell you what's probably happened? You've forsaken the word of God for some time. And you need to be renewed in your mind. You need to come to faith again about what God says is true and kick out the lie and start living the truth. God tells us even now to tell people directly what he says. How we tell them is just as important as what we tell them. Did you catch that? How we tell them is just as important as what we tell them. Tell them in meekness, in charity or love. Tell them in conviction and boldness of the truth. I was having a conversation with someone not too long ago. And they said, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I said, you know what? I've already come to faith on these issues. I've already battled through those questions. I've come to faith. But you can't have my faith. You have to come to faith on these issues. On these questions. How am I going to do that? If you don't believe this is the absolute truth for all of mankind, you won't come to faith. I told that person this. I said, listen, you have wonderful questions. It's good to have questions. There's nothing wrong with questions. But if you're not absolutely sure of what God's Word is and what God's Word says, you won't be here long. It's just a reality. What if they don't believe when I tell them directly? Moses was commanded, tell them directly what I've said. What if they don't believe me or they won't believe me, as he says in verse number one? then we need to let God use what we have and use us. Moses said they weren't going to believe him. It was, again, just another way for him to try to excuse himself from the call of God and work of God in his life. But God has more for him to use to help people receive what Moses said. We've already covered it, but he tells Moses, what's in your hand? He says, a rod. Throw it on the ground. It becomes a snake. God tells him to grab it again. It becomes a rod again. God tells Moses to put his hand in his shirt and his bosom right over his heart. And he takes his hand out and it's leprous with, uh, with leprosy and white as snow, as the Bible tells us. God tells him to do it again. He brings it out and it has his other flesh again. God tells Moses there in verse 5, if they don't believe the word directly, I can use your possessions and your life miraculously to convince them. 
If you're trying to share the truth of the gospel to somebody, if you're trying to convince someone that God's way is the best way, if you're trying to convince someone that the Bible is true, but they don't believe the word directly spoken to them, what can you do? Let God use what you have. Let God use your possessions in a miraculous way for His name. You can tell people directly of God's truth, but if but is the truth of God's word a reality in your life? Are you with me? If you're going to say Jesus Christ is the Savior for all of mankind and that He can change any person's life, which is true, has He changed your life first and foremost? Have you given Him the things you possess to use miraculously for Him? Pastor, I don't have anything to give them. I'm young or I'm too mature, too old. I, I'm too young or I don't have much. All I got is I don't really have anything to give them. Don't think that what you have can't be used for him. God used a stick. That sounds funny. But he used a stick. That's what Moses had with him every single day of his life. For 40 years, he was a shepherd. He was out there keeping Keeping, uh, keeping his father-in-law's flock safe. And he had a stick. He had a shepherd's staff. And he used it. God used it for him. You know what? God can use an idiot box for his glory. Other than Mr. Isaiah and Miss Kyra here this morning, I think every person in here has one of these things either in your pocket or in your hands right now. This is a possession. It is yours. Can I ask you, have you given it to God? Or is it yours? Have you given it to God to use for His glory, for His name, so that He can miraculously use this to share with others the truth of who He is, to convince them that they may believe that He is God? That He is the best way, for, or that He is the only way to salvation, that He is the only life worth living. Have you used this lately for His glory? Have you used this lately for His glory? Have you used your money lately for God? Have you given your money to God, or is it all yours? Don't think that you don't have anything that He can't use. He can use even anything, even a stick. Well, that's so funny. It is funny in a way. But you know what? It's awesome in a way too because only God can use a stick to make people say, okay, I believe. You know what? God can use a social media post to cause somebody to say, wow, that makes sense. I believe. Don't use your possessions like the world uses their possessions. Don't use your car to go to places and to do things that would blemish the name of Christ. Don't use that technology to watch immoral and ungodly things and then share, well, look, did you see this? It's so funny. No, it shouldn't have been watched by you anyway. Don't use your phone to listen to the world's music. Have you given Him your phone? Have you given Him your computer? Have you given Him your social media account? Have you given Him your car, your finances, your music? Have you given Him your entertainment? Have you given Him your job? He can use them if you'll let Him. Let Him use your possessions in a miraculous way that others may believe. Are you with me here still? Someone's going to ask you, hey, what's your favorite music? What's, the, what's your favorite song? And you're either going to lie, depending on who asks you. Because I can almost guarantee you that if I walked up to somebody in this room today and asked them, what's your favorite song? I didn't say him. What's your favorite song? There's probably going to be a pause there to stop and reflect. Which music should I tell them I enjoy? And you're either going to lie or you're going to tell the truth. Oh, my favorite song is this. But if somebody outside of church were to ask you, you might say something else. Can I encourage you? There's some great godly music available just at your fingertips. Computer, 
cell phones, tablets. I encourage you, you need to find one of them. And I, I have three that I really enjoy, really three that I listen to almost exclusively. My favorite at the moment is Haven Radio. You can find it in the, in the uh, store app of whether you got Android or you got Apple, Haven Radio. It's wonderful, wonderful. I really enjoy the music, I do, but one of the things that I enjoy more than the music is the programs that they have. My wife and I turned on Haven Radio yesterday, driving home from our outing, preaching going on. Oh, it was such a blessing to me. I needed it. KNVBC, you've heard that before. Brother Carney uh, promoted that while he was here. Great radio, internet radio ministry. Another one is one that I found because of Miss Miss Barb. She listens to Abiding Radio a lot. It's a great radio program. Great radio program. What's your favorite song? I'm not saying what's your favorite hymn. I'm saying what's your favorite song? Because God knows it already. What, who do you follow on social media? What social media influencer, and the younger generation will understand that term a little bit better, who, which social media influencer do you watch most? Can I tell you, I don't think that there's any out there worth watching, but take that for what it's worth. What do you like binge watching on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube? What dances have you put up on Instagram and TikTok? Again, our younger generation understands that one pretty well, huh, Danny? Yep. And I see it a lot. You know what it looks like? It looks like you're having a spasm. It looks like you just had a brain aneurysm. But you know what I'm talking about. What messages and pictures are you sending to that person hoping that nobody will find out about? God already knows. Do, don't allow your possessions to be used of the devil in your life. Brother Zada said it this morning, either God has your heart or your heart is filled with sin. And I'll say the same thing in a different way. Either God is using your possessions or the devil is. Don't allow your possessions to be used to hide the light of Jesus Christ. Don't allow your possessions to be used to bring contention in your family. Because if there's contention in family over a device, over a possession, I can tell you this, that's not of God. Contention is not of God. Contend for the faith. Yes. But contention over a possession is not of God. Give your possessions to Him so He can miraculously use them so that others may believe. God used a stick. He can use you. And He can use what you have. Have you made your life available to God to use miraculously that others may believe? Have you given Him your attitude? That's not a possession, by the way. Have you given him your attitude? What's your attitude like? What's your attitude towards your parents? What's your attitude towards your children? What's your attitude towards your fellow church member? What's your attitude towards your preacher? What's your attitude towards when your life is challenged from the word of God? Have you given God your attitude? Give God your emotions. Don't let your emotions run your life. Emotions aren't necessarily bad things to have. God has emotions. We're created in the image of God. But God doesn't let his emotions run away with him. God doesn't make emotional decisions. Are you with me, church? Control your emotions. How do I do that? Check your emotions about against God's word and how you should respond. Renew your mind. Have you given God your emotions? Have you given God your attitude? Have you given God your talents? Oh, there's such talented people in this room today. And God would get so much glory if he could have access to them. Some of you sing beautifully. Just so quietly that nobody can hear you. Some of you. 
Some of you don't sing as lovely. And you let it be known. I don't care if I don't sing lovely. I'm going to give God a joyful noise. And praise God for that. Some of you that sing really well need to balance those of us who don't sing very well out. <laughs> Lift up your voices and sing. Some of you can play some, uh, some instruments. And some of you are, have interests in other ways. And you have talents that can be used. God can use that in you for him. Have you given him your life and body to do something miraculous with so that others may believe? Let him keep you pure. Let God keep you pure. You know what? It's, in my opinion, it's, it's a minor miracle. If a young person gets to the marriage altar, a virgin. It's a miracle. It's so promoted, so advocated. Those of you that, hey, all of us are here. We've all experienced it. The temptation, the pushing, the peer pressure, all of that. It's a miracle when a young person gets to the marriage altar, a virgin. Let God keep you a virgin. Why? Because God can use it for his glory. Let God keep you happy and fulfilled. And can I tell you, there's only one way that's going to happen. Is if Christ is preeminent in your life. What does that mean? First. First. In all things. Let him have your testimony. It's a miraculous thing in this world that you would find a Christian who has been raised in church who never drank alcohol before, who never smoked before, who never watched pornography before, who remained pure, who was free from depression and anxiety. Hey, these are miracles. But it's possible. Let them have your relationships. People need to hear the truth. They need to hear it directly, right? But they also need to see the truth in action. People will watch your life and how you live your life. They'll watch how you use your possessions. They'll watch where you go to see if you've really met with God. Moses was really just saying this. God, we know his ultimate attitude was he didn't want to do it. But it was still a really good question to ask or a good statement to say, God, they're not going to believe me. So God said, here's proof as to how you can show them I've met with you. Throw your stick on the ground and it became a snake. Put your hand in your bosom and it became leprous as white as snow. Hey, go grab, get some blood or excuse me, some water out of the river and then pour it on the ground and it became blood. I'm going to give you evidence that I have met with you so that others may they believe. And can I tell you what one of the biggest problems is with modern day Christianity is there's no evidence that we've met with God. We're miserable wretches just like the world. We're in the same sinful condition, the same sinful positions as the rest of the world, even though we've been set free. We, we, we're out there living in, for, in fornication and immorality. We're using our devices to watch the same horrible things, and God isn't getting the glory. So why would others believe? And then there are those who are doing that. And praise God for it. And they're looked at, looked at as freaks. Man, isn't that, kind of, isn't that kind of radical? Pastor, what you're preaching is radical, and it would require a radical change in my life. Hey, God did something radical for you. He died for you. It's your reasonable service. People will watch your life. They'll watch how you use your possessions. They'll watch where you go to see if you've really met with God. To see if you really found the answer to life and to see if you have what they are really missing. 
Do your possessions and your life show the miraculous power of Christ? Do they show you've met with him? Let him do something miraculous with you. One of... uh, The biblical counseling courses I've taken, the pastor that was teaching this course said this, and I liked it. He said this, There will always be skeptics who try to explain away the Bible. That's why it's so important you don't quit as a Christian. They they can't explain away what happened to you. If you quit... They don't need an answer. You provided it for them. I like that. There's always going to be someone that can try to explain away the Bible. We know they can't, but they're going to try. But you know what is going to be the litmus test for them as to whether or not the Bible is actually true or holds a shadow or any shadow of a chance that it's real? whether or not your life lives it. This isn't spelled out in the scriptures, and we got to hurry. This isn't spelled out in our text like the others. But I believe the truth is here for us to see. We'll just think about it a little bit. Moses knew the truth of God's plan. It was that God would deliver Israel out of bondage, as he promised he would do. And we saw how Moses first approached God's plan. He killed an Egyptian. He tried to bring peace amongst his own people. He tried to establish himself as a leader of his people. And now that Moses has met with God about God's plan, Moses has to take a different approach. Now his approach is all on God, whereas before it was all on him. He was trying to do something for God, but he was trying to do it all on him. His approach was, I have to do this. His approach now is, God's enabled me to do this. Now he has the right attitude in in approaching God's plan. I can't, but God can. I am no one but I'm going in the name of the great I am. He had to go directly approach the elders instead of trying to subtly get their attention with his actions. Well, I killed this Egyptian. I just figured you guys understood that I was the new leader. Now he has to go and approach them directly. Now he has to direct not only the, uh, excuse me, approach directly the elders, but also Pharaoh, whereas before he tried to subtly kind of slip in there and undermine Pharaoh, now he has to approach Pharaoh directly. He had the direct word of God for the elders and for Pharaoh. No more trying to just do it through subtlety. If you want to tell me something, just tell me plainly. Don't try to be subtle. I probably won't get it. Well, I just figured you understood that because I said this, A, B, and C were what was going on in my life. No, something's going on in your life, just tell me directly. I am not that smart. I'm not that observant. That's what God's doing with Moses here. Direct. If you've met with God and know his will, it is almost an absolute certainty that you're going to have to approach that issue differently. A change of life or a change of approach to life, a change of approach to relationships, a change to approach in child raising, a change to approach in church attendance, a change to approach in finances and witnessing. Moses had a good desire. It was God's desire that the people would be free. But he approached it wrong to start with. You desire a loving marriage, obedient and loving children, a more friendly church, a more understanding parent. Those are good things to desire. But can I encourage you with this? You may need to change your approach. 
You may need to change your approach in communication, in your actions, in your demonstration of affection and love. And we can continue on. So learn how God wants you to approach that issue and use his approach. You may need to be direct, loving. You might need to be more observant and patient. You may need to stop talking and listen. You may need to forgive and take the pain of an offense to the cross and forgive as God forgave you. You may need to renew your mind about the issue and stop believing a lie and acting in a lie. You may need to change yourself first. You may need to change your approach. You know what's so great about this thought this morning? It doesn't matter how much or how little you have. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. It doesn't matter if you're in good health or in bad health. It doesn't matter if you have a great past or a horrible past. God can miraculously use anyone to help others believe. To believe what? First in salvation. And then for those who are saved, to believe that Christ is the only life worth living. If you will give God your possessions and person and ask Him to use them for His power that others may believe, He will. It will be a testimony to others you've met with God and know His plan. It will be evident because it will be revealed and lived out in your life. Let me end with these thoughts here. Is it evident to your wife or husband that you've met with God and know His will? Is it evident to your children or grandchildren that you've met with God and know His will? Is it evident to your friends that you've met with God and know His will? Is it evident to your coworkers that you've met with God and know His will? You may have told them directly, but can they see it as a reality in your life? They will see it as a reality by how you use your possessions. They will see it as a reality because of how you live your life. They will see it as a reality because you may need to change your approach. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come before you today, and I thank you for the opportunity to be in this church. I thank you for the message that you laid upon my heart from the Word of God today for these thy people. And I know you love us, dear Father. And I know that you've spoken to hearts directly today. There are some who have said one thing, but their life is living another. There are some who need to change and give over the use of their possessions to you so you can use it for their, your honor and glory. There are some who are pursuing a different life than that which Christ died for them to live. There may be some here today that need to be saved. And I pray to God that through your word and through your message today that you have convinced them through the Spirit of God that they need a Savior today. Help us, dear God, to live our lives that others may believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Brian Crump from Lighthouse Baptist Church here in Holbrook, Massachusetts. Thank you for tuning in with us today. I pray the message was a blessing to you. I'd like to ask you now about your eternal destination. Are you 100% certain that heaven would be your home? God tells us in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. God wants you to have that certainty today. How can we have that certainty? First, we must acknowledge and admit our condition before God. Romans 3.10 tells us, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That verse is simply telling us that we are not perfect. 
I'm not perfect and you're not perfect. But perfection is God's standard for any person to get into heaven by themselves. But we're not perfect. And Romans 3.23 tells us why we're not perfect. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our sin in the very different ways that it can come out in a person's life has caused us to fall short of God's standard of perfection. And our sin has a payment attached to it. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That means that what we deserve for our sin is death. And that's talking about a spiritual death as described in Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15 and Revelation 21 verse 8. An eternal separation from God. But God loves us and he doesn't want us to experience that payment. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and for me. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love for you and for all of the world with his son's death on the cross. Now we have the opportunity to receive as a free gift eternal life forgiveness of sins. The rest of Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not anything that we can earn. It's not anything that we deserve. We can't be good enough. We can't be spiritual enough. It is offered by God through Jesus Christ as a free gift. So how do we receive that free gift? Romans 10, 9 tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The way that we receive the free gift of eternal life is to place our faith in God's word and his work on the cross. That we receive by faith his gift in a prayer of faith. Something similar to this. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that you sent Jesus Christ to die for my sins so that I may receive eternal life. I would like to receive the free gift of eternal life that I may be forgiven of my sins and have heaven as my home. If you would say a simple prayer of faith like that, the Bible tells us you would be saved today. And anyone who would say that prayer would be saved. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray you'll make that decision today. If you make that decision, would you please contact us? Our website has all our contact information. We'd love just to be able to rejoice with your decision today. Thank you again for tuning in with us. God bless.